brother. That's right, this week I added a jacket because Goblet is when it starts to get dark. Guys, welcome to part four of Dumbledore's Big Plan, where today we're going to be discussing Goblet of Fire. If you are brand new to the series, I highly recommend you go back and check out parts one through three, but otherwise, let's go. We pick up after the highly impactful events of Prisoner of Azkaban, where Peter Pettigrew has escaped and set out to resurrect Voldemort. And once more, Dumbledore has his own goals for Harry as he heads towards his inevitable duel with Voldemort. The one for like all the marbles, that is, though, not the one in the graveyard. Dumbledore has no idea that's gonna happen. In fact, I dare say Goblet stands apart in a big way from the first three in terms of stuff Dumbledore doesn't plan for. In the last two books, he has had to act in a somewhat reactionary role where he is responding to a developing situation. Those being the Chamber of Secrets being opened and Sirius Black escaping from Azkaban. This time, however, he is much more in the dark. Like, while it is clear there is a situation developing, he has no idea who or how it's happening. In fact, Dumbledore is so not in control this year, we honestly considered calling this episode Voldemort's big plan. Except in that case, you wouldn't really need us to explain anything because that's just, that's, that's the whole book. It's just, the whole book is Voldemort's big plan. The whole thing is spelled out. Bertha Jorkins. Barty Crouch. We re-liked the Goblet of Fire. Harry the Champion. Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? No way, the cup is a porky. Harry's blood. Bavada Kedavra. That's where it goes wrong. But that's not to say Dumbledore doesn't have any plans in this book because he totally does. This book actually contains one of the most crucial lines that actually confirms Dumbledore's plan in the entire series. I speak, of course, of the Gleam. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. If not, you will. Let's do this. Guys, before we dive on in today, I have to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly subscription to a literal box of awesome. For $45 a month, you can select any of the available boxes, which comes loaded with $70 worth of premium gear. And the contents of those boxes range from anything you might need for your daily dose of awesome. Whether that's grooming goods, barware, cooking tools, outdoor gear, or our personal favorite, the ever useful champagne saber. Although I have to say, right now they do have one thing that has been seriously calling out to me since I've been so stuck at home. It's called Rooted, a low maintenance plant that comes in a very handsome vessel because let's face it, there's no better way to spend the intermeaning hours than wetting your plants. Who wrote that? <laughs> Feels like there was a better way to say that. But if that's not for you, they have loads of highly curated boxes. And if you're still having trouble deciding, you can actually take a quiz to just narrow in on what it is exactly you want and need. So if you would like to get 20% off your first box, you can go over to boxofawesome.com and enter the promo code SUPER at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER for 20% off your first box. Link is in the description down below. So today I would like to start at the end, during the end of year feast when Dumbledore is giving his speech to the entire school because he says something that I feel like really sums up everything he's trying to teach Harry that year. I say to you all once again, in the light of Lord Voldemort's return, we are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Lord Voldemort's gift for spreading discord and enmity is very great. We can fight it only by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust. Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open. Friendship, unity, trust. These are the hallmarks of the goals Dumbledore has for Harry this year. Friendship, unity, trust. If you need an acronym, try FUT. It's almost like fun and not at all tough. His first goal is to introduce Harry to the wider wizarding world and start promoting the idea of unity. Second is to educate Harry about the unforgivable curses. And third, and this one is a bit more reactionary, is to start showing Harry what the world was like the last time Lord Voldemort was in power. So let's start with expanding Harry's horizons and giving him a greater scope of what's at stake should Lord Voldemort return. This is super important for Harry's future because thus far, most of his exposure to the wizarding world is 
just Hogwarts, and if we're being real, mostly just Gryffindor House, where he has indeed blossomed into the brave Gryffindor Dumbledore intended. He's won the House Cup three years in a row, he's received an award for special services to the school, and he even brought home the Interhouse Quidditch Cup. But the issue with Hogwarts being most of your exposure is that Hogwarts itself is a pretty divided place. Sure, Dumbledore didn't want him to end up in Slytherin House, but that doesn't mean Dumbledore actually thinks any lesser of the students in Slytherin House. Well, I mean, let's be honest, there was probably a nicer way to award the points at the end of the first year. I mean, it's not like the Slytherins actually did anything wrong. He didn't have to embarrass him in front of the whole school, but the point is, he did. Sorry, that's actually not the point. The point is, if Dumbledore had it his way, all four houses would coexist harmoniously. So, Dumbledore approaches this in two ways. Right out of the grate, that'll make sense in like one sentence, the Weasleys arrive in the Dursley's fireplace. Ha! There it is. Fireplaces have grates, you see. Although, ironically, they don't actually even make it out of the grate in this situation, but whatever. I stand by that pun. Either way, they are there to pick up Harry for the Quidditch World Cup. This is a huge deal for the oh-so-poor Weasleys, who have somehow managed to not just get tickets to the event, but also tickets for guests, and also they're the best tickets in the entire stadium in the top box! Which, for me, is just one old big red flag. The top box? What? Really? Okay, so we know the tickets come as a gift from Ludo Bagman, and the explanation is that he is returning a favor to Arthur because Arthur got his brother out of a weird situation with a lawnmower that was acting unnaturally, and he just smoothed the whole thing over. Here's 10 tickets to the top box. I'm sorry, but I just don't think so. I mean, 10 tickets to the top box. Like, that's where the Malfoys sit, and the Malfoys are like peacock owning rich. I'm just assuming peacocks are like really expensive. No. Let me tell you, as someone who personally started their career in event marketing, the tickets the event gives you to give away are rarely good tickets. Certainly they are not front row tickets unless there is also a huge marketing campaign accompanying that particular giveaway that's going to help you sell lots of other tickets. The idea that Ludo is giving away 10 of the best tickets in the entire stadium for a favor he is like twice removed from is just just laughable. Especially, and this is really important, when you consider that Ludo Bagman is in terrible debt when he does this. Selling those tickets rather than giving them to Arthur would have been easily the fastest way out of debt. I mean, when Peacock Man and his son Draco get to the top box, they even joke. Good lord, Arthur, he said softly. What did you have to sell to get seats in the top box? Surely your house wouldn't have fetched this much. Now, obviously he's being quite antagonistic in this situation, but I have to think he is also quite correct. Just fun fact, according to StubHub, the average cost of the worst tickets to go to the last Super Bowl was $4,750, with private boxes ranging all the way up to 60,000. I'm sorry, but I need to know because this is important. What was that lawnmower doing? The point is, Ludo is desperate for money and is just willing to help Harry cheat for the entirety of the book, and yet he gives away essentially a small fortune? It just doesn't sound right. Except we also know that he has been working with Dumbledore for the past few months arranging the Triwizard Tournament. And if you ask me, Dumbledore is the one behind this generosity because it is vital that Harry go to the Quidditch World Cup and if he isn't able to go with the Weasleys, then he doesn't really have anyone else to go with. That might sound like a weird and big favor to ask of Ludo Bagman, but at this point, and we'll get into it a little bit more later, Dumbledore already believes that Harry is going to have to sacrifice himself so it is vital that he understand the scope of Voldemort's terror should Harry fail to defeat him. And speaking of the Triwizard Tournament, that is part two of Dumbledore's plan to expose Harry to the wider wizarding world. Because if things had gone to plan and Harry's name hadn't come out of the Goblet of Fire, then it would have been a great opportunity not just to meet foreign wizards, but also to unite all four houses within Hogwarts behind one champion. And speaking of of the Triwizard Tournament, that is part two of Dumbledore's plan to expose Harry to the wider wizarding world. It's honestly a really elegant and creative solution where everyone might have got to have a lot of fun and meet some new inner house friends and international wizards, except it all goes astray when Harry's name comes out of the Goblet of Fire and the school ends up more divided than ever. Whoopsies! Speaking of whoops though, let's dive into goal number two, which is educating Harry about the unforgivable curses. So typically,
typically you wouldn't start learning about these until year six, but now that Pettigrew has escaped, Dumbledore must feel that Voldemort's return is eminent and that he really needs to get Harry in front of this information now. Now, I've always kind of thought the actual explanation for the reason Barty Crouch Jr. was teaching the students the unforgivable curses was because he's actually a Death Eater and the idea of putting students under the Imperius curse all day was just sort of a laugh for him. But the more I think about it and the more I look at Dumbledore's plan as a whole, the more I think Dumbledore actually did want Moody to teach the students about these curses. I mean, first of all, he is under the impression that it is the actual Alistair Moody teaching the students. And Barty Crouch Jr. even says, Professor Dumbledore's got a higher opinion of your nerves. He reckons you can cope. And I say, the sooner you know what you're up against, the better. I don't know when in my mind Moody became a pirate, but he does have a peg leg. And could wear a patch. Maybe should. And you might be thinking, uh, but Jay, surely he's just lying and Dumbledore wouldn't actually approve of this. But here's the thing. There is like no way Dumbledore does not know this is being taught because the whole school is buzzing with what Moody's classes are like because they're so intense. And it's not like he just teaches them at once. It's like several, several lessons. Dumbledore definitely knows this is happening and does nothing to stop it. Which can only mean Barty Crouch Jr. is telling the truth, including the part about putting the students under the Imperious Curse. Yes, it sounds terrible, but terrible is what Dumbledore is up against in Voldemort. And sure enough, this early training does pay off for Harry, who later is actually able to successfully throw off the Imperious Curse when Voldemort casts it on him. And besides that, Barty Crouch Jr. also tells us that it takes real strength of character to throw off the curse, which Dumbledore definitely knows Harry has based on what he saw in the mirror. So I feel certain Dumbledore knew Harry could do it, just wanted him to have a few rounds of practice ahead of time. Plus, if Voldemort does return, you can bet tons of people are suddenly going to be under the Imperious Curse, and being able to recognize it is really important because it encourages restraint. Think Stan Shunpike, for example, during the Battle of the Seven Potters, who Harry spares because he recognizes the Imperious Curse. But that brings me to goal number three, showing Harry what the wizarding world was like the last time Voldemort was at large. Like I said earlier, this is not something he would have planned from the beginning, it's much more reactionary, but since Dumbledore has been reading the signs the whole book, I think he feels like it's a good idea to pass this information along to Harry. This happens when Harry accidentally discovers and enters the pensive in Dumbledore's office and witnesses the trials of Karkaroff, Bagman, and Barty Crouch Jr. And I say accidentally with air quotes because it is so not an accident. I was using the pensive when Mr. Fudge arrived for our meeting and put it away rather hastily. Undoubtedly, I did not fasten the cabinet door properly. Naturally, it would have attracted your attention. Yes, yes, naturally, it is totally fine for you to invade my private thoughts and observe sensitive information about the innocence of living people who you're seeing on a regular basis. Totally fine, cool, awesome, great. No, but for real, Harry, did you see what was going on there? I hope you were paying attention. I could like run to the bathroom and forget to fasten the handle again if you need. Like, I kind of have to go, actually. I better. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Certainly it doesn't seem like Dumbledore cares that Harry saw this. The only thing that really catches him off guard is when he learns that Neville hasn't told Harry about his parents, which is the only thing he asked him to keep a secret. But the reason I think Dumbledore wants Harry to see this is not to just throw shade at the accused, but to show Harry how Voldemort was able to spread such terrible mistrust through the wizarding community. On Voldemort's side of things, Karkaroff reveals that the Death Eaters don't even really have loyalty to each other. They're willing to turn on each other if it benefits themselves in the long run. I mean, it's not really that surprising, but there it is. Bagman's trial represents how an obviously oblivious and innocent person has been cast under serious doubt and suspicion, which again kind of echoes back to that idea with Stan Chumpike. Like, Harry immediately recognizes 
this person's not a Death Eater. I mean, I don't know if he's a good guy. Don't let him near your lawnmower, but. And then of course is the trial with Barty Crouch Jr., which shows us the breaking of families, which shows how even people who claim to be on the good side of things are willing to shatter bonds and mistrust even their own children. You really can't understate how instructive and important these three memories are for Harry going forward. Think for example, how Harry responds to Lupin when he asks if he can abandon his family to come join Harry and Hermione and Ron. Harry ain't having none of it. But that brings us to the gleam, possibly the most important line in this whole book as it relates to Dumbledore's plan. For a fleeting instant, Harry thought he saw a gleam of something like triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. But next second, Harry was sure he had imagined it. For when Dumbledore had returned to his seat behind the desk, he looked as old and wary as Harry had ever seen him. This triumphant gleam of Dumbledore's comes immediately upon hearing that Voldemort took some of Harry's blood into himself. And the triumph is Dumbledore realizing that for the first time, Harry might actually have a way to survive the final duel with Voldemort. It's Dumbledore realizing that Voldemort is now sort of acting as a love crux, if you will, to Harry and tethering him to life. But if Voldemort used the killing curse and nobody died for me this time, how can I be alive? I think you know, said Dumbledore. Think back. Remember what he did in his ignorance, in his greed, and his cruelty. He took my blood, said Harry. It means that as of Goblet of Fire, Dumbledore already knew Harry was a Horcrux and that he would have to die in order to defeat Voldemort, that Harry would have to sacrifice himself. You've kept him alive so that he can die at the proper moment. You've been raising him like a pig for slaughter. And this, this is the reason why it is tantamount that Harry understand what is at stake. That when the time comes, Harry will need to have to have the courage to face death. Because it's not just about Harry's personal battle with Voldemort. It's not just about killing Voldemort or saving Harry. It's about saving the entire wizarding world. Harry has to understand the gravity of the situation so that he can do the other thing Dumbledore asks everyone to do at his end of feast speech. If the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy, remember what happened to a boy who was good and kind and brave because he strayed across the path of Lord Voldemort. Until the end of Goblet of Fire, Dumbledore doesn't know Harry might have a way to survive the final duel. He believes he's going to have to die, which means he has to count on Harry in that moment to do not what is easy, but what is right. And there you go, guys. That is part four of Dumbledore's Big Plan. Make sure you tune in next week when we dive into Order of the Phoenix. If you have any other thoughts for things we might have missed in Goblet of Fire or things we need to make sure we include in Order of the Phoenix, leave your thoughts in the towel section down below. And set your reminders right now. This Friday, May 15th at 6 p.m. Eastern, we are going to be hosting another live stream where we'll be talking about Dumbledore's Big Plan. But more importantly, we're going to be hosting a giant game show where all all of you will be the contestants. We're gonna be using the Kahoot app, so you're gonna to wanna to make sure you download that ahead of time and have an account set up. We are limited to just the first 2,000 people who get in, so if you want to play along, make sure you are there early. The grand prize for the winner of our Harry Potter Trivia Hour will be a complete collection of all of our awesome animal foil shirts. Thanks so much for watching today's video. Please remember to leave a like on it if you haven't already, and subscribe so you don't don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you want to see part five of Dumbledore's Big Plan, make sure you check out this video right here, unless it's the first week, in which case it's not quite linked over there yet because we haven't filmed it yet. But otherwise, until next week, Ben, I'll see you in another life, brother.